but like DNA is bad storage, and I'm coming at this from like I'm I'm a like kind of like a structural biologist, so I don't i I wouldn't call myself like a computer scientist by any means. Um, so there's a lot of this that I would I would not say I don't understand. I hope we can have like a pretty interesting conversation about this afterwards because I'm gonna keep like the talk kind of short. And there's like some interesting questions that I think this subject brings up that I, I'm interested to see what people think about. Anyway, so um, so digital DNA. Um, so we have a problem going on in society right now that I didn't know about. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're in the zettabyte area, and we just got there this year. So internet traffic makes, um, like, like in tw in 2016, internet traffic was making on average like 88 exabytes, um, and I and it looks like it'll be like 44 trillion gigabytes by 2020. Whatever. All those numbers are like huge. Like, what's this six trillion of gigabytes? Like. This stuff makes um, means almost nothing to me, but I guess like the big thing is the thing that like scared me about this is that um, we're basically going to run out of like flash memory, like the silicon that we can use as flash memory by that time. So if like all of this information was being stored on flash, then we would like flat run out of silicon, which I, I like I don't even, I can't even really conceptualize. Um, so yeah, so the, the um, so from zettabytes gets to yottabytes, which is all named after Yoda, which is your fun fact of the day. And then your other fun fact of the day, <laughs> your other fun fact of the day is um, 10 to the 34 bytes is called a domo mega mega grata byte, which I thought was like I love these are funny. Okay, anyway, so, <laughs> so storage limits. What does that mean? Um, so like. When you what your hard disk, which is I guess made, um, like magnetic um, hard disks, are have like a lower read write speed than flash memory, um, and they don't la they they last a bit longer. So like the long term data storage that we use, uh, that's used for like banking industries and recording health health stuff, they're sort of like these magnetic tapes, which have like five to ten year like periods of time that they're still usable, like a a lot of data scientists say that they don't, they wouldn't trust anything that's like more than five years old. So they like are constantly like copying these over, and that requires like a lot of energy and a lot of upkeep, and also um, like that stuff reading that stuff out isn't as fast as using flash memory. So this is like a big problem. That's what I'm getting at. And um, I guess so. People have been like proposed the idea of what, like why don't we use DNA? Like let's learn from biology in order to store these things. Um, and that, that proposes an interesting idea, right? Because DNA is like super dense um, information. Well, like there's some crazy statistic, like what, that, what it says up there, one kilogram of DNA can store all the world, world's data as it exists now. What kind of compression, like I don't know what that exactly means because like of the compression involved and like how that, I, I, I don't know how much that number actually means anything, but to imagine that it's one kilogram is still pretty interesting. So. Like, this is an interesting topic, but there's a couple of issues with storing things as DNA, um, which I'm going to get into, but I guess we can all imagine that the big thing is, like, how do we randomly read out pieces of DNA? We want to sequence it. By virtue of sequencing something, we have to, like, kind of, like, you know, cut up and destroy it, which is also not great. Um, and then there's also, like, the issue of synthesis, which I'll get to at the end of the talk. But, um, yeah, so when was the first time that anybody used DNA as that? Um, so the first time was there was an artist, Joe Davis, who made this rune out of 35 points of DNA, and it was like just like folk, like um, it was like an honor off, yeah. But it's like Microminus, which happened in uh, 1988 at Harvard, which I thought was cute. It means like Earth, I think, like Earth goddess. That's the thing. But um, so like so this was the first time, but not nothing really happened on the subject until like 2011. Actually, I think this paper was published in 2012. So George Church, um, the, uh, in George Church's lab, the postdoc um, Kasari and then like the geneticist um, Yuan Gao at um, John Hopkins, together they published a science paper in 2012, which is like really short and very like interesting if you're, you want to see it again. Um, but on on like, and he stored his own book, which is like also really funny. Like George Church stored a copy of his own book in an HTML format. Which was how many gigabytes? Um, oh, which was uh, 5.27 megabytes of information as DNA. But they had like a couple. There's a couple issues with this. They like made a couple mistakes. Um, there's a 
like I think they lost like 25, like um, a couple strings, and it wasn't actually like a very accurate reading because the way they did this was they, so like there's a couple issues with um, storing D, like DNA, being that the structure of DNA itself um, sometimes makes hairpins, which are hard to read and hard to store. Uh, there's also the issue of sequencing is can have like um, inaccuracies, misreads, and then synthesis on the microarray chip. So they use like the Agilent microarray technologies learn to synthesize their DNA strings. And there's some um, like inaccuracies in that process as well. As, and so they didn't do um, any replicate strings or um, error correction in this process. They kind of just kind of did like a straight proof of concept. And I think it was like zeros were like A's and C's and um, ones were G's and T's. So like if you just do it like that way without any type of like if, like um, redundancy, kind of leaves room for errors. And that was kind of the conclusion of this paper was like people should work on error correction and a bunch of other things and making redundant strings. So that was this was the 2012 paper from the church lab. But Neil Goldman's lab at EBI put out another paper in 2013 which has this schematic scheme for creating more redundancy as well as um, like iterating through the the, um, all of the uh, nucleotides every single time in order to avoid homopolymers. So like multiple multiple a A's in a row, like a bunch of A's in a row was, would really mess up with sequencing. Another example of this is a bunch of C's and G's in a row. Um, they, can they can introduce errors in sequencing as well as synthesis. So um, there's like a bunch there's a bunch of things like that that can do, that um, interfere in like the mechanism of synthesis and sequencing when it comes to storing DNA. But I think this is an interesting mechanism of using it. So what they did was they have like what they the things that they stored were like an ASCII text file of like Shakespeare's sonnets. And they had this like binary text file and that was like base three encoded into um, like like just like zeros and ones and then and then they used like a Huffman code which I'm sure the concept people in the room know what, know what that means, but all I know is that it changes binary to trips. So yeah, um, but they also encode that in the DNA and use, use that in order to make that the trips code. And the big thing for me that was interesting was they have like these strings which um, like have like have 25 base pair, like, like it's like 70, 75 base pair repeats basically, like going down. So everything is recorded four times over. And that's one way of like introducing redundancy and also like error correction. Um, and that could be bin like there's been binning and indexing information on either side of each of these strings. Um, and so there's like some I don't I, I really don't like these figures. Um, yeah. But uh, basically I think like what the big thing to conclude from this is that like as it, as it stands now, they, they conclude at the end of the paper that like basically 98% of the cost of doing of making like this information had to do with synthesis, it, and it like it's because like synthesis is still really expensive. Um, like like I think it was like two percent of it was the cost of the sequencing run when they read out the information, uh, and then we have, like the other thing they they talk about is the error. So basically like this was 100% accurate, but they had to sequence the entire genome, which is like not great. Um, and also they lost like a small portion of, so like uh, one of the, like they had the ASCII text file, they had like a bunch of different types of data, but one of the things they encoded was a PDF of the wa original um, Watson Crick paper. And they lost like some of that in the process of like sequencing, which they weren't, they were, they're pretty sure if it's a sequencing error, not a synthesis error. But it's still, um, yeah, they like they still lost some data in the process of like reading out that information. So that's the results of this paper, and that was in 2013. And I think, oh, uh, shit. Okay. Um, so there's like this kind of like how long, like what does this mean? Like how like having DNA as data storage, like how long can DNA last? And that's like a pretty another interesting paper that came out in 2013, which I guess I'm going chronologically on this. Um, is that the like they found an ancient horse, like a Pleistocene horse, and they sequenced it, and it was like 700,000 years old, which was like um, pretty crazy that DNA can last 700,000 years in like a chunk of ice in Canada. So, like, what what does that mean for like us storing DNA for like long periods of time? I I would say that like the accuracy of reading this out and like like I think all they did was like map the mitochondrial genes and see like oh where did the horse come from um, like how like what does this mean for actual data storage in the future uh, 
I doubt 700,000 years, but I'm like definitely like 100, right? Okay, anyway, this was um, in, 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 like one of like proof of concept things. Like DNA is like probably like, very, very stable. Um, so another paper in 2015, um, this is kind of the proof of concept that we can introduce randomly access DNA data storage. And this is using, they rather than, so they have like, at the top of this figure, like part A, shows like that figure from the golden paper, where they have like those strings and like the 25 base pair um, like pieces of information from those strings, um, like presented four times over, like copy four times over per string, right? Like um, that, they're, instead of doing that, they have like a bunch of other methods, which I, I don't completely understand myself, but I'm sure you can read this paper and do it. Um, but basically, they're using like an in indexing as well as like PCR and CRISPR in order to read out information into what, like, like copy out a bunch of information and then sequence that so they can like in access it. And they're using like a key and value method in order to bin things by like specific pieces of information. I think that's like so. I, it seems like pretty obvious to me that like a, like some kind of primary extension method in order to like read out the piece, like key and value pieces of information, um, and then using this method and a bunch and, and some other stuff, Microsoft as well as Eva um, released a paper where I thought the images they used were kind of cute, um, where uh, where they do they they were saving these images in a similar thing, but they also used XOR. Um, parity in order to like reduce uh, like like I guess compress the information even further. So I guess like the conclusion of all of this is like we're getting we're getting better and better at creating like um, like storing DNA in like a in a pretty compressed and like a, like error free method. Like this all of this stuff is getting better and better. Um, so like uh, I have this I have this slide. Um, where like, so like DNA synthesis, uh, you can get like, we're, we're getting like closer and closer to like getting really good at synthesizing the target length of, of DNA using like these Agilent microarray technology. It's still not to get a single length, which is like supposedly really accurate, but the big thing is cost. And that is something that we need to get like, like we need to make it like one millionth time cheaper in order for this to be effective. Like there's like a, a really great quote from the postdoc on the original George Church paper, and where he's like, "This is never going. This is not going to be feasible unless we get way better at synthesizing DNA." And if, like, when we say way better, we mean like one million times as good as as we are now. And it needs to be like com comparable to, to sequencing, which is now like we're getting way better at sequencing. So, um, so that's like leads us leads me towards like, what is the current stage of this? There's like a ton of startups. I have a couple on here. So like Gen 9 uh, no longer exists actually. It was bought by Gingo. Um, you, you were just talking about. But the big one I guess is Twist, which has like, I, I wrote down how much money they have. Um, it's like 133 like, like million dollars or something. Like they're on their fourth, their fourth or fifth round of um, Investors, but it's all that it's all all that's listed on the website is like the equity, right? So we don't know how much like grants they might have, but um, all of that they're also embroiled in a pretty interesting lawsuit with Agilent. So I don't know what that means either. Like the CEO of Twist um, might have like probably took a lot of intellectual information from Agilent. So I guess like um, we're on the verge of like a, so like a, the other thing I wanted to talk about is like this is kind of like. The, I made like another reason to get good at synthesizing nucleic acid, like long nucleic acids, other than like the other thing is HP, HGP, right? Right. So there's like um, that's like the they're saying, oh, we want to like generate like these big chromosomes for all of these reasons. Maybe this is like a better reason, or like another like another reason to like we should be interested in this this field as like synthetic biologists. So. I'm interested to hear. Oh, and then the other thing, this figure right here, the launch, the data drive, you can buy that on Amazon. It's like a little piece of DNA data, and it's like an image, and you can put it in like a gold capsule and buy it for two hundred dollars on Amazon. If you want that, I, I don't know why I want that. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of people who have who are sticking their feelers into this. Like Microsoft is obviously. I think IBM has like is interested in this as well. Um, so I'm, in, I'm interested to hear, like, when I have a conversation about, like, synthesizing long pieces of nucleic acids. So, yeah. Questions and references. And I took a lot of this information from this really great nature review 
by Andy Extrans, which is written like really well. It's like an Atlantic article, like, but it's published in Nature, so I highly recommend. <laughs> So you can totally see somebody like 
re like rehydrating a bunch of like basically the idea of like what a data storage center would look like with nucleic acids would be like this facility with like a bunch of refrigerators and like just lyophilized DNA and PCR tubes and rats and that's like all of the medical information for people like 100 years ago or something or like not like the national archives are kept that way or something like that. That was all about restriction. Yeah. <laughs> Like, in the past, like, some, somebody 